Hey there, folks. Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but first, there's a passage in John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 46, where Jesus says, If you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. Now, don't go back there and read the whole Torah again, looking for Jesus, because you're not going to find it there. An apologist will say, well, they mean, he means the spirit of the Torah, or the Torah as a whole, and uh, they'll say things like, the form of the conditional sentence shows that the protasis is a supposition of an event contrary to the fact. Yeah, again, nonsense. Is the biggest speech in the Bible by Moses. It's right before he dies. It takes up all of Deuteronomy chapters 5 through 30. And the first four chapters, he's recapping everything that's happened since they uh, came out of Egypt. All right, and in chapter 4, verse 2, he gives this command here, you must not add or subtract to what I command you. So that's the commandment, not to change the commands. Simple enough, right? Now, in Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 15, he says, the Lord God will raise you, raise up a prophet like me, from among your brothers and you must listen to him. And again, Christians think that this is a hint or a foreshadowing of Jesus 1400 years into the future. They call it a dual prophecy or something like that. Okay, and they're probably the same people that think Paul McCartney is dead because on the cover of Abbey Road, he's not walking in step with the other three band members and he's not wearing any shoes on his feet. And if you listen to it very carefully, at the end of Strawberry Fields, you, it sounds like he's saying, I buried Paul. Oh, oh, well, Paul McCartney, you must be dead. You wouldn't bury someone that's still alive, right? And blah, 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 blah. Anyways, let's get back to sanity, clarity, reason, and the truth of the scriptures. Moses is talking about Joshua here. If you think he's not talking about Joshua, I want you to turn to the first two chapters of Joshua and read it very carefully, okay? Now, the next question I would have is, how will we know whether or not Joshua is telling the truth? Hmm, that's a good question. So there's several ways we can spot a false prophet. Uh, one of them is found right there in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the message does not come true or come to pass, that is not a message that the Lord has spoken. How many times in the New Testament do you see Jesus and Paul and the other letter writers and the very end of the book of Revelation saying that Jesus is coming back real soon. Some of you will not taste death before you see the coming of man. And again, apologists will say things like, well, he doesn't mean soon, like in our type of language, what we mean by soon, but it's a progressive, slowly revealed revelation, blah, blah, blah. How do I know that Jesus, when he says soon, doesn't mean more than 2,000 years into the future? Because in his own parables, he talks about a man being gone for a long time, like 10, 20 years, something like that. So if... He doesn't say, he doesn't mean that to be like 2,000 years off into the future, does he? He says a long time. So if a long time means like 20 years from now, how can soon mean 2,000 years from now? Now, Deuteronomy 13, verse 1, also tells us that if a prophet or dreamer rises and proclaims a sign or wonder to you, and if the sign or wonder he has spoken of you comes true, but... He also says, let us follow other gods which you have not known, and let us worship them. Jesus pulls rabbits out of a hat. He tells you to find a gold coin in a fish's mouth. He performs miracles. Um, but then he says, believe in God, but also believe in me. Okay? And we're not going to get into the whole, well, Jesus is God. So the simple question you got to ask yourself is, did they know Jesus at Mount Sinai? No. So Jesus says, believe in me. And what do people do? They draw pictures of him. No, don't make them look ugly. You want your gods to look beautiful. So they draw these beautiful pictures of Jesus and pictures of Holy Spirits in the form of doves, and they hang them on their wall and they venerate them. It's the opposite of what God's telling you in Deuteronomy. 
And finally, <clears throat> he says that he's going to send false prophets to test us to see if we're paying attention. Right there in Deuteronomy chapter 13 or verse 3, he says, For the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and all your soul. So, yeah, you could say he's speaking about Jesus as a warning. Now let's look at some of the text itself from chapters 5 through 7 in, in Matthew. Now, as uh, if Deuteronomy was Moses' last speech, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' first speech. Here's a question I have. Why didn't Jesus write anything down himself like the prophets did? Moses wrote the Torah Isaiah wrote Isaiah, and so on. They said, hi, these are the things that I've seen from the Lord. My name is Isaiah. They, it's not like some anonymous author that's writing as Isaiah. So that's the difference, is that there's no accountability in the New Testament. It's just anonymous stories here. But, speaking of Jesus writing things, there was another Jesus called Jesus of Sirach, about 200 years before Jesus. And... If you're Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. This is in your Bible, just like Tobit and the Maccabees and all that stuff. That's not in the Tanakh, and it's not in the Protestants' version of the Tanakh, which they call the Old Testament. But Jesus of Sirach actually picked up a pen and a scroll, or a quill, whatever they used back then, and wrote this stuff down. Jesus didn't write anything. He relied on people in a foreign land and a foreign tongue to wait till he was dead to write stuff, so... Imagine if the Founding Fathers had relied on somebody else to write the Constitution for them. What if James Madison and those guys just got up on top of a hill and said, Hey, uh, First Amendment, Second Amendment, things like that. And people would write it down and they'd probably all have different things. That's why if you want to get a message across, you should write it down yourself. And at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, that's where Jesus gives the Beatitudes. Again, it's kind of like Moses at Mount Sinai. Why wasn't it called... Instead of Sermon on the Mount, it could have been called Sermon in Peter's Backyard or in Judas's Living Room or something like that. But no, it's got to be a mirror of Moses. And he gets up there and starts saying things like, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, that kind of sounds like Sirach, chapter 7, verse 34. In your King James Version, Fail not to be with them that weep, and mourn with them that mourn. So it's not an original idea. It's not something Jesus is coming up with. Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That's just a rip-off of Psalm 37, verse 11. But the meek will inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. Sirach, chapter 9, verse 8. Turn your eye away from a shapely woman and don't stare at beauty belonging to someone else. Doesn't sound that much different than Matthew 5, 28. I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. So it's nothing new and amazing and astounding. Jesus isn't coming up with anything that we don't already know. Let's look at some other stuff here in the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to turn to chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. The very first verse he says, Be careful not to perform your righteous acts before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now this is a contradiction of what he just said in the previous chapter. Uh, he says in the previous chapter, chapter 5, uh, verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, are we supposed to let our good deeds be seen, or are we supposed to do them in secret? He gives us contradictory messages here.